Welcome to another episode of Living Communion. Thank you so much for joining us here. We are so blessed to have you back. Um, first, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them little less than a god and crown them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, last time on Living Communion, we got into the mendicant orders, and particularly uh, St. Francis and uh, the impact he had. Um, and um, now we're going to talk about another pretty impactful guy, <laughs> very impactful uh, philosopher and theologian in the history of the Catholic tradition, and obviously foundational um, for anyone who's looking at Catholic social thought um, or Catholic thought in general. Um, uh, Matt, can you tell us who we're talking about? Who is this foundational figure in the shadows of the Catholic social tradition? Uh, that would be Thomas Aquinas for 500. <laughs> um, so... Uh, when we're talking about Thomas Aquinas, most, not everyone's heard of him, of course, but, but a lot of folks have heard of Thomas Aquinas. He's one of the most famous Catholic figures, um, and he's one of the most famous philosophical figures. Um, you can study Aquinas um, in school without ever being a Catholic or having any interest in Catholicism because his impact on modern thought was so huge. The um, other figure in the Catholic tradition that lines up with that kind of um, uh, influence on um, philosophy is St. Augustine, who, who we talked about a couple episodes ago. Um, but really, if, if you trace um, philosophy from um, antiquity through you know, Plato and Aristotle to modernity, you can't really talk about modern philosophy and, and philosophical history without talking about Aquinas um, and, and Augustine, of course, but Aquinas is, is that huge. And um, his, his story is um, kind of an interesting one. He uh, wanted to become a Dominican and his family was against it. Um, they actually locked him in his room and the story goes that they actually um, threw a, a prostitute in the room with him and locked the door in, in the hopes to kind of get him to um, not want to be a, a celibate Dominican for the rest of his life. And um, it didn't work. <laughs> so um, he, he ended up uh, joining the Dominicans against the, the um, initial um, protest of his family. And um, when he was in school, um, he was actually given the nickname, the dumb ox. And for, for someone who's so known for his, um, the greatness of his mind, um, it's kind of an, an odd nickname. And the, the reason was that he was very quiet um, for the first you know, while he just sat there and he listened and um, everyone thought he kind of just didn't understand his, his fellow classmates. And then 
finally he opened his mouth and started talking and they realized that it wasn't that he wasn't smart it was that he was methodical and he would think in great great detail um and so he he had this depth of thought that he would really ponder and ruminate on things he wouldn't just come up with like you know kind of a witty response or a quick response which I think is maybe a model for our own times and how we, we think about intelligence. You know, we put people up and we expect to hear quick responses from them, you know, sound bites, great quotes, and really intelligence can require a, a solitude of mind in, in some way of pondering and a, a willingness in, in Aquinas's mind when you read his thought, how many different people he read and kind of ingested their thought and were conversation partners with him, which gets into his model of, of thought. You know, we talk about um, scholasticism, and I, I think Mark might be saying a little bit more about scholasticism in general. Um, but Aquinas used this um, dialogical method um, of writing and of thought where you would propose something and um, he would give the reasons for why you would argue for that, the reasons why you would argue against that. And at the end, he would say, this is what I say. And he would give his response. And sometimes his response would basically be in line with one of the things that was said before and enumerate on it. But sometimes he would take some of the things that are said before it, you know, in favor of it, some of the things that are said in contradiction of it, and harmonize them in, in this really beautiful way. Um, that, you know, he, he would line them up and say, well, in this way, this applies, but in this way, that applies. And we really have to understand what this thing is in its entirety to understand why we can say these seemingly contradictory things. And these would be quotes from the church fathers who we talked about, you know, briefly, quotes from scripture, quotes from, you know, Augustine, he, he quotes Augustine a lot, um, quotes from, uh, um, Aristotle as, you know, a philosopher who, who he was very big in using, and from um, uh, Plato, um, which everyone kind of says, you know, uh, Aquinas just sort of um, absorbed um, Aristotle into Christianity, and that really is a disservice to Aquinas, um, because there is something that um, Aristotle hated, which was the idea of participation, because Aristotle didn't believe anything existed outside of the empirical realm that we could sense and, and see and, and um, talk about. And Plato believed in all these forms that existed outside our realm that everything conformed to. And um, what Aquinas did is he, he used the idea of participation, participating in these forms, as a way of talking about goodness and truth and beauty and how the world as it is participates in the goodness and truth and beauty of God. Um, and then that all comes down to us. Um, we're not part of God, but God created us and we're, we participate in the, these attributes of God because we're made in his image and likeness. And the world participates in these attributes of God because it comes from God. Um, so and, like one of the things one of the things I wanted to pick up that you just said that really ties. So, you know, you had these figures, right? So maybe some people weren't that familiar, but Aristotle was this massive figure in philosophy. And, yeah. he, and I know that <laughs> and Plato as well. These are figures that had such, especially Plato early on, but these figures had a huge influence on how people just thought about the world, like what their framework was. And it was like Aquinas was able to take these figures take the early church fathers, take some of the, the people from the Eastern part of the church as well, and bring them into a, a synthesis almost, almost, a, almost mm -hmm. a synthesis or development. And, and one of the things that you, that you brought up there, uh, Matt, was this idea that, that, that God is that, we're, again, we're not a part of God, but that you're talking about truth, goodness, uh, and beauty, and, and how we're able to... You said you said participate. You use that word a few times, and it kind of harkened in my mind back to people who maybe listen to this podcast. Harken back to how in the in the idea of the of the garden, right? God, you know, you're walking with God in the garden. God, you see like the 
uh, this unity and, and that that's in that God is not um, radically uh, separated from us, inaccessible to us. And it's not this this purely materialistic view, but um, this idea of, of, of God's presence and accessible in these ways. You're talking about goodness, truth uh, and beauty. Yeah. And and that participation is key for, I think, talking about a lot of what um, Thomas Aquinas says um, that. You know, we, we talked about virtue earlier um, in, in our first episode, and we talked about um, the Ten Commandments and how they help focus us so that we can develop the virtues. Aquinas wrote so much on, on the virtuous life that it, it, that it could be its own podcast, just Aquinas and the virtues, <laughs> not its own episode, its own whole podcast. So we won't go too far into that, but... Um, Again, what he, he understood is that developing these habits and dispositions of goodness allowed us to participate in God's goodness. Another way we might say that is that the virtues conform us to Christ. They help make us more Christ-like. Um, and another thing he, he understood, you know, again, truth, beauty, and goodness as attributes of God that we participate in, he understood that they accentuate and elevate each other. So you can't talk about reason without also talking about goodness and beauty um, because good reason has its own type of beauty and leads to goodness. Truth should lead to goodness. Um, Goodness should um, accentuate and, and lead to truth. And this was key for for his understanding of logic and reason. The more conformed you were to living a moral life, the better able you would be to see the truth, which we don't understand that at all in our society. We see logic and reason as kind of independent of anything else. Um, But it makes sense if we're influenced by our passions, by our vices, by our sins, by desires we shouldn't have, our inclination to want to see things clearly that maybe are inconvenient to us or or um, might limit us. Again, like the moral law, how it, it acts as bumpers in a bowling alley and we bump up against and it's there to remind us um, when, we, when we don't want necessarily to be reminded by it. Um, this is what um, living a, a good moral life helps us to, to see truth more clearly and, and truth helps focus the moral life. And both of those things should be incredibly beautiful. Um, and the greater our capacity um, for, for that, the, the more we're able to, again, um, you know, live, live a virtuous, live a, a reasoning life. And um, those should be convincing to others. They should have their own beauty that people look at and say, wow, there, there's something really appealing about that that I don't see elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and in our modern, again, our modern society, I don't think we, we really adapt that understanding of truth and beauty and goodness at all. Um, and, you know, so I, I will leave off on, on kind of the... the um, background on Aquinas and dive into the two things I really want to talk about um, for Aquinas as they apply to justice. Um, And the first one definitely relates to, and the second one does as well, and actually relates to to Mark's prayer that he led us in, which is great. Um, But the first one is the Aquinas' sense of the divine, natural, and of civil law. Um, So three types of law. And this is actually, if you go back and uh, read um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail, um, he quotes Aquinas directly, which is, it's kind of weird to have a <laughs> Southern Protestant preacher quoting Aquinas, um, but, but he, was, he was a very knowledgeable man. Um, and he understood um, Aquinas' understanding of law, and that was what led to his um, justification for civil disobedience. Um, so this has very direct um, applications for, for how we live our life. And his, so Aquinas' basic understanding of law is that the divine law is identical with God's law. 
um, what God knows and tends created the world for is, you know, we can say that's divine law. Uh, natural law is what's embedded into the created world. Um, and it's known in our hearts, in our souls, in our consciences, but because of sin, particularly the effects of original sin, we're not as in tune with it as we, we should naturally be, as we would have been, you know, um, pre-original sin. Um, and so the, the natural law, though, is um, reflected in, among other things, the Ten Commandments. Um, it, it reminds us of how we're created to be. And again, it, it focuses back on our identity. And then civil law is, um, and I should say, there, there's no contradiction between natural law and divine law. Civil law is the laws that we make as human beings. Um, and these can be made by a king, they can be made by a dictator, they can be made by a, an elected representative or assembly. Um, you know, it's any kind of human-made law. And what Aquinas says is that these laws bind us to the degree that they conform to the natural and divine law. That civil law is binding on us absolutely if it's in line with natural and divine law. Civil law is binding on us if there's no contradiction between it um, and natural and divine law. Um, so for instance, speed limits, you can have some debate about whether the speed limit should be 20 or 25 miles per hour in certain areas, or whether it should be 55 or 60 or 65 in certain areas on a highway. Um, whatever that government decides, based on scientific studies, research, road conditions, traffic flow, whatever, um, there, there's not gonna be much of an argument that it contradicts natural and divine law, whether they go with 20 or 25 or 60 or 65. Um, whatever number they, they choose is, is binding on us because it doesn't violate natural or divine law. But any law that does violate natural and divine law is not binding on us because we are obligated to do differently. Um, so for instance, um, the, the example I used earlier, um, civil disobedience with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. going and doing sit-ins or, or marches, um, you know, for instance, where you're saying, you know, I don't care if you say that your, your diner is only open for, for white customers anyone of any skin color should be able to eat in this facility. And we're gonna come in, we're gonna sit here. Um, and we're gonna wait to be arrested because we know it's against the law. Um, but we're breaking the law because we know it's unjust. Um, and we want to draw attention to its injustice and the injustice of this legal system. That's a powerful um, point that, that you brought up because I think, you know, and when you're talking about, you know, the fact that we're called as, as people, but called even more particularly as Christians and Catholics to adjust life and a life of justice. <clears throat> and that's not always necessarily the civil, like the civil law does not equ is not equal to the justice that we're called to in our, in our lives. And I think that may be a concept that some people understand, but some people don't. And when you bring out the example of of somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. and how he would quote, you know, St. Augustine and quote uh, Thomas Aquinas, um, you know, about a just law is no law at all in these, in these, in, mm -hmm. in these realities. Unjust law is no law. Unjust law, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An unjust law <laughs> is no law at all. Um, that may seem like that's just kind of like vague philosophy, like, oh, he quoted this nice sounding philosophy. But when you get into it, this is actually very practical for the life of a Catholic person because it calls us to recognize that we are always called to, and it reminds me of an early church father, I can't remember his name, but he talked about how everywhere that Christians go, right, they live a morally exemplary life, no matter what culture that they're in. This was an early church writer, I can't remember his name, who, who talked about that. But just how- like when, uh, what are to Diogenes or yep. Diogenes. Yep, great. Um, um, I don't know how you say his name. But. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Um, 
But um, yeah, and so we're called to live a life of justice that's exemplary, that is not the bare minimum life because the civil law will never represent the totality of what we're called to as Catholics um, in terms of justice. Um, and I think we're, yeah. sorry, because we're called to participate in God's life. Exactly. We're supposed yeah. to be like Christ. The law can never, the civil law can never encapsulate that. So again, that's why I wanted to get into this idea of participation because yeah. we really are connected that deeply to God in our essence. Um, so sorry to interrupt. No, and that's and so I'm not saying yeah, disobey all laws because you supersede law. I'm just <laughs> I'm just saying like that we're actually called to a higher form of life. It's kind of like how Christ, you know, a lot of people were scandalized by some of Christ's actions, but Christ was living in perfect conformity with the will of God at all times. He was always living in complete conformity with the divine law. But other people were saying you're breaking kind of our customs. You're kind of breaking our how we see the world like our mores and and but and catholics we have to recognize that sometimes we're called to be non-conformists right we're called to be different than the world we're called to live a more uh deeply participatory participatory life in christ which means that we will be challenging uh we'll challenge injustice in the world because we'll be called to just by our lives we should um because we're called to live a higher form of justice than necessarily just the civil law the civil law, but then also beyond that, even if necessary. Yeah. So the, the last point I wanted to make was, was oh, should be very quick, and then Mark can can jump in with all of his great insights. Um, it's what Aquinas called the universal destination of goods, and basically it's the idea that God created everything, which you know that was reflected in our our psalm that we we read um, and prayed with, that God is. Um, this giver, um, and we are we are stewards of creation, um, and creation is given to all of humankind, not to any particular individual or set of individuals. So the idea behind the universal destination of created goods is that when someone is without, um, that's a, a poverty, not just for that person, but for all of humanity, because we're failing in our stewardship. And, um, and this is echoed in church teaching. This isn't just what Aquinas said. This is actually echoed in, in official church teaching. It is a form of theft, which we've talked about in justice and just, distri just distribution of goods. It's a form of theft. If you have too much and knowingly withhold and hoard it, um, from people who, who do not have enough. Um, you are the thief because God created all goods for all people. That doesn't mean that you have to have only the bare minimum. Um, but if you have an excess and you can give to someone who has less and, and actually needs it, um, that's part of the universal destination of created goods. As, as a Christian, we're, we're called um, and as the world is created, we're, we're supposed to ensure that everyone has what they need. Yeah, and so just on that point, Mark, can you tell us about how Aquinas sees justice? We talked about justice a couple times, mm -hmm. but I know Aquinas has, he goes in depth on justice. Can you walk us through that, uh, that view of justice? Well, I can just in uh, the, the broadest of terms. I mean, um, Matt was talking about how truth and beauty and, and goodness uh, uh, are, are belong to God and that human beings are, uh, can participate in that. And to the extent that they do, they can say by analogy that they know something about God. The same is true of, of justice. God is just. And to the extent that human beings participate in the justice of God in our own lives, then we are just, okay? So that's kind of the, the framework. And, and the, the, the genius of uh, Aquinas is that he was able to synthesize, you used that word before, synthesis, he was able to synthesize in a systematic way, faith and reason, scripture and uh, natural law, uh, philosophy and theology. And not only that, but uh, the Christian scriptures 
with pagan philosophy, with the, <laughs> with the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato and, and others. So, all right, so anyway, so it, when, when talking about justice, uh, Aquinas begins with uh, the, his assertion that human beings are social creatures by nature, that we are not automatons or just individuals living by ourselves, that we are part of society. And so justice places the individual in relation to other people. So uh, we, justice places us in relationship both to other individuals and that is what is referred to as commutative justice, the justice that exists between you and me. And we also are, uh, justice places us in relationship with society as a whole. And that's what uh, Aquinas referred to as distributive justice, that which we owe to society at large. Commutative justice, that which I owe you as another human being, distributive justice as what I owe to society, okay? Then the next, uh, well, another point that he brings up is that justice is always ordered toward the common good. And when we hear that phrase, that that's a, has a very modern ring to it in terms of Catholic social teaching, okay? So, and, and Matt has already addressed this, because of that, because it's, it's ordered toward the common good, Justice is considered a general virtue. It is one of the general virtues, okay? And so um, th then yet another point about justice, you know, as Matt said, Aquinas was brilliant at drawing out distinctions uh, in, in any kind of uh, concept. So he said that justice and the common good are achieved in law, in civil law, okay? And so he call this kind of justice legal justice or general justice. And it's this concept of legal or general justice that translates into what we now call social justice. He didn't call it that, but the, the two uh, concepts are, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are very similar to each other, okay? So he, would, he concludes by saying that whatever we do, should always be ordered in, in terms of justice, should always be ordered toward and motivated by the common good. We should be motivated more by the common good than we should by the achievement of our own personal good. Okay, so that's, a, that's a difficult concept to, <laughs> uh, to, to, to sell, if you will, but it's a very important one. So. Matt already addressed the universal destination of goods. So let me just use uh, private property uh, as, as an example. I'm going to repeat some of the things that Matt said. So Aquinas said that private property is acceptable. It is all right for people to own things, okay? Because uh, private property gives us an incentive to work and private property also helps to create peace in society, okay? When people own things they're, 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 that helps create a social peace. But Aquinas also says that private ownership is merely a form of trusteeship. Be why? Because as Matt said, the earth does not belong to us. The earth belongs to God, okay? And for that reason, and, and this is part of the natural law, why did God create the earth? He created it not so that it could be owned and hoarded by individuals. God created the earth and all the goods in it so that everyone on earth could use them. That was God's intention. That is the natural law. That's God's intention when he created, okay? So the right of all people to use what they need to sustain their life supersedes is more important than the right of individuals to own as much as they can possibly acquire. So ownership, private ownership is not an absolute right. There's the famous example of the man who is starving, needs to feed his family, 
uh, is not able to, to work or acquire the, the bread that he needs in any other way than to steal it, he is morally justified in so doing because he is uh, taking care of, of the needs and the, uh, of, his, of him and his family. And that bread is then being ordered properly. It is being, it's, it's, re, uh, it's, it's achieving its proper destination, okay? He said this, this is a quote, human beings ought to possess external things, not as their own, but as common, so that they are ready to communicate them to others in their need, okay? So you can see why Aquinas uh, uh, the, the, the philosophy and theology of Aquinas are so foundational for the modern Catholic social teaching. Modern Catholic social teaching is based both on scripture and on natural law philosophy, okay? And that is a, a, a direct result of, uh, of Aquinas and, uh, and scholasticism. Yeah, I, I think wanna, it's so, echo, oh, go ahead, Matt, sorry. please. I wanna echo just real briefly, uh, some great things that, that Mark said. One is, um, I'm talking about the different forms of justice. Um, we're recording this with a bit of a buffer, so I'm not sure exactly when this will be released, but we're in, in real time right now, just a, a few weeks removed from the 2020 election cycle. Um, and there's a lot of obsession for a lot of people on getting the right laws in place, whatever you imagine those laws to be in terms of justice, how to make society look the way you want it. And I think Mark's point that that's one dimension of what it means to live a just life in that our, our life also to be truly just, we have to be just in our relationships in one-on-one in -on -one interactions with others and in how we contribute to society as a whole. Um, I think lends a lot of fresh air to um, kind of an understanding of how we can live justice in our everyday life, regardless of what may or may not be happening in the legal system and politics and what influence we may or may not be able to exert on that. Um, so I, I think that's really kind of important for us to, to think about in our own lives. Um, so thank you, Mark, for, for pulling that out. Um, sure. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just important. Um, there's so many just important things um, that you brought out, and I think one of those was that was that anecdote that <clears throat> that's that famous story of the man who is poor, without food, without um, without any other capacity, and is dying of starvation, and so he needs to get he needs to take this to take this bread for his sustenance and survival. And how he could be morally justified. Many people would say, okay, wait, 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 wait. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal or covet someone else's goods. So how right. in the world can we square what we're saying with the Ten Commandments? How can we square the Catholic tradition that way with the Ten Commandments? And I think one of the powerful things when we talk about um, how we even started in the Garden of Eden. And talked about how we were all created to be in this union with um, the world with God, with each other. And then we talked, we even moved forward um, after we went through the, the prophets and the uh, went through the law and the prophets. We talked about how, um, you know, we see the, the, the early church community, the Jerusalem community sharing their, this idea that God created this world for all of us um, and for us all to thrive is very countercultural to how we think. Um, <laughs> it's very, you know, it kind of, it, just, it almost takes out our undergirding foundations um, because we don't really see ourselves in that deep of a relationship that even though obviously we all know we're here on this earth together, we all know that we are the same humanity, hopefully, um, we still think it's pretty radical that you would say, wow, this person who really is starving to death, you know, if he doesn't have that $1.50, he really just needs to die. Like, I think, <laughs> I think that some people may still have that kind of view. They don't, they would still, that would still be a, a barrier for them um, to really accept that, uh, what you just said. Right. And we'll see in the enlightenment that there were, there was at least one, you know, social political philosopher who did say 
who did disagree with Aquinas and who said, oh, no, that guy should be prosecuted. It doesn't matter <laughs> whether, <laughs> whether his family's starving or not. The other thing that Aquinas said, though, and all, you know, just to, 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 to tell the whole story, is that once the, the guy is able, the guy who steals is able to uh, provide restitution, he needs to do yeah, that. Yeah, he needs to, you know, he needs to pay it back. It's not a free ride, you know. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but understanding the fact that you know human life and the and this person's like humanity can supersede, you know, just that that kind of monetary barrier because of the fact and the reality that um, all goods um, all goods originally have been given by the by the gift of God to all people. We're all we're all stewards in some sense, but like yeah. you were saying. It is then, you know, in order to when when you do take something that that did, that person did have it as well, so you want to restore it when you can. But human life is uh, is sacred, and so we have to we always, of course, like um, should look at that as being a higher value um, than well, that, that moment right. having the compensation. And the and the natural law. I mean, there are several different natural law philosophies and theologies, but they're teleological in nature. In other words. You know, they're always focused on when God made the world or when God made this or that or the other thing, what was God's intention? Mm -hmm. So when God created the earth and all the property, if you will, that's in the earth, what was God thinking? What was God's intention? And the answer for Aquinas and for Catholic social teaching now is that it's intended for everybody to use. Everybody is entitled to what they need of the goods of the earth in order to live their lives and fulfill their their God given uh, the, their God given potential, everyone is entitled to the opportunity to thrive, and and that that idea I think is largely lost on on our on our, on our modern world. It's like, well, I got mine, and you know, too bad about you. That's not what Catholic social teaching says at all. I also think you don't see that in the life of Jesus Christ. You know, when we, we've kind of lost Jesus Christ as a model um, really for some of these questions. I mean, and obviously going back to the life of Jesus Christ, he being God, you know, lives this everything out in perfection. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I think that we can never exhaust the gospel freshness and just how just how, how he approached these these tough questions of of mercy these these things that for us sometimes catch us up but we we see christ not getting caught up in so many of those complexes he's kind of the he's always he's always moving in in this in this way where he again is holding to the highest form of justice recalling um that he's the son of god that he that he has this uh um and that all people are sacred and that they have this divine destiny, even when it goes against maybe the immediate thought, you know, I, what comes to mind um, first and foremost is the, uh, the woman caught in adultery and how this woman caught in adultery committed uh, a, what in that time was a mortal sin, really like you were going to get stoned um, right here in this public space. Um, but out of, out of the recognition of the sacredness of this woman, I would say, he, he said, your life matters, but don't sin anymore, but your life matters. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, with that, I believe everyone would say, wow, this is, you know, because she was meant to die under the law. Is Christ breaking the law? Like is Christ, is, is he disobeying the, the will of God, the father? Um, and we could easily say, no, of course, <laughs> Jesus Christ is living in perfect continuity with the will of God, which is that this person would thrive, that this person may have made this mistake. Um, but that this, but that Jesus Christ, who is the wellspring of forgiveness, um, is calling this person to thriving and to uh, and to um, and to living and, and to and to recovering from this uh, this experience. And I think having this these eyes of mercy, um, first and foremost, are something we can always draw back from the gospel when we when we just revisit these. these yeah, things. when you when you think about. Uh you know, Jesus and, and justice is certainly, he, he intuited, you know, the, the justice of God. And yet it seems as though at the end of the day, he believed that the mercy of God 
superseded uh, even, even justice. Let me give you an example. So there is the parable of the owner of the vineyard who goes out in the morning and says, you know, you won't go out and, you know, pick, pick some grapes. And then he goes out at noon, then he goes out at three and he goes out at five. And, you know, they, they go out and they work and they, all, and they all come back and he pays them all the same. So those who have been out there for one hour are getting paid exactly the same as those who have been out there in the heat of the day. And when the, the workers growl about it, the owner says, are you jealous because I'm generous? And to me, that's, you know, uh, in, in, in a sense, in, in the, the strictest um, sense of the term, um, the owner of the vineyard isn't just, but the owner of the vineyard is more than just. They, uh, you know, and, and the, I think Jesus is trying to say there that the generosity of God is, it goes beyond strict justice. And, and I think that's, you know, uh, that, that, that's an important lesson uh, from, from the scriptures. We'll see that the, you know, uh, we'll see next week when we talk about the enlightenment that, you know, the, the, this um, scholastic system uh, came to be, you know, uh, re rejected um, and, and um, you know, a whole range of, of other philosophies that were, um, which, which um, really uh, was the coronation, if you will, of, of pure reason, okay? Uh, and, and the scriptures were, you know, were completely left, uh, left out of it, okay? We'll see that, that uh, um, even though some of these people uh, some of their principles were in, would end up being in line with Catholic social teaching, that there is a, a pretty radical departure from the, 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 uh, the synthesis of faith and reason and theology and philosophy that's embodied in the Enlightenment. Yeah, I want to um, follow up just briefly on, on the comments about God's justice and, and mercy. Um, one of the kind of mind-bending things for us is that God is indivisible. Um, so to, to say that God has certain attributes is not really proper. To say that God is just and God's justice is different than God being merciful is different than God's love. It's actually that God's love and justice and mercy are all the same um, because God is, is one and indivisible and... Um, we, we always have to talk about God by analogy, and we can only understand um, God imperfectly. And so I, I think it's helpful to remember the, the quote from the prophet Isaiah, that my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts, says the Lord. Um, and God's justice, um, yeah, when, when we think about paying those, those workers in the vineyard, that doesn't seem just. Um, one, one thing from that is it says he pays them all the usual daily wage. Um, and what the usual daily wage was, was what you need to live on. Um, and so when we think about justice from God's intention for creation, as we were talking about earlier, that everyone has what they need, is it God's mercy? Is it God's care for us? Is it God's justice? Is it, God, is it God's love? It's all of those that, that God gives those workers what they need to live for the day, whether they worked one hour or eight hours or however many hours, 12 hours. Um, I, I think that's something, again, that we, we have to kind of look at God, at how beautiful God is. I don't think we allow ourselves to marvel at the, the beauty of God's goodness for us and God's differentness. And I, I think we should really be able to say, thank you, God, for being different from us. Because <laughs> if God were like us, the world would really have no hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> the same uh, so I, I think we're, we're ready for our takeaways. Is that right? Um, yeah. So I, I think I've got two, two takeaways. One is, is kind of in line of what I, I've been saying. Um, just now to 
take some time actually just to reflect on who God is, to um, think about how loving God is. And if you don't know God's love in your life, then I would suggest you, you pray for an experience of God's love. Say, God, help me to know how much you love me. Um, help me to know your love. So take some time to, to pray with God and, and appreciate God's beauty and goodness and love. And the other is in line with um, what I was saying about discourse, because I think the, the level of discourse in our society has reached an alarming level of ineffectiveness and, and um, just being dangerous. Um, you know, it, people are afraid to talk to each other, don't know how to talk to each other. And like Aquinas, who listened to so many voices and took the time to sift through them and pray over them and listen and try to understand how they could harmonize correctly, become a listener. Um, we don't have to respond right away to what someone says. And this is hard for me. So this is advice for myself because I, I love getting into deep conversations. Um, but really try to be a listener first. Um, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth, use them in proportion, right? Um, you know, take, take the time to really understand where people are coming from and what their concerns are um, and, and sift through that in your head before responding. Um, feel free to come back to the conversation another day. One of my favorite quotes from Aristotle is philosophy can only occur between friends. And that's because you have to have trust. You have to have a, an openness to hear and understand where someone's coming from. And you have to have longevity in these conversations and an openness to someone coming back and saying, you know, you mentioned this five years ago and it's really kind of stuck in my head. And here's what I finally figured out about it. And then go on and say, wow, I never thought about it that way. Or, or yeah, you know, in being able to continue these conversations as, as we go along in life in, in a common understanding that we're pursuing truth and, and want to live a good life. Um, so those are, those are my takeaways. Pray about God's love, appreciate God's love, ask for, for God's love and listen, listen, listen. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, I think my takeaway is uh, uh, based on something that uh, Aquinas taught at one of his uh, presuppositions, and that's that we are uh, social creatures by nature. It sounds like a pretty simple idea, but I think we live in an age when individualism is so rampant that in some ways we have forgotten how to be social creatures uh, in terms of, you know, uh, are, are making a living, you know, there is a, a general acceptance of, well, I'll, I can make as much as I want and you're, you're on your own. You know, I got mine and, you know, now you, 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 take, you take care of yourself. Otherwise, it's just too bad for you. In our, in our discourse, uh, we, we've lost the civility what Matt referred to as the friendship that allows people uh, of different to, to voice different perspectives without cursing each other out. Uh, and, and, you know, those to me are signs of, uh, of an individualism that has uh, overreached. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, Aquinas's idea of that, that we're social creatures. We are born into a world with other people, that we are not here on our own and just to make take care of ourselves is something that's pretty sorely needed in the world today. My takeaway is, <clears throat> um, is revisit the gospels intentionally this week. Just visit them in some way. I try to do it every day because we have to remember that our baptism calls us to conformity with Christ and that the only in that it's i remember the the verse uh blessed are the uh pure in heart for they shall see god we, god is so beyond our 
full knowledge, but in Christ, God's fully revealed. And that that can help us to understand how can we navigate these challenges? How can we move in our social context? So as you're thinking about the Catholic social teaching, how do I live in this world? Christ is always um, someone who you should uh, be reflecting on and thinking back on and meditating on through the Gospels um, as a model and as the author, really, of your life and the whole world. And just in his simple acts, can we understand better the justice of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, um, and really the care of God for us all um, as people and as a society? Um, so thank you so much for joining us uh, here on Living Communion. We look forward to seeing you, hearing from you next week. And uh, yeah, hopefully we will hear from you soon. Uh, leave likes, comments, subscribe. We would love to have you with us on the entirety of the ride. Thank you.